We're finishing up an example of applying the microscopic momentum balances to a steady flow. And the flow we've been considering is flow down an inclined plane. So this is the problem. Calculate the steady state velocity profile <coughs> for the flow of an incompressible Newtonian fluid down an inclined plane. We applied the continuity equation for the mass balance and the Navier-Stokes equation for the momentum balance. We assume steady flow with a constant density, Newtonian fluid, meaning we use the Navier-Stokes equation. We assumed wide flow, which has no Y variation um, in the velocity. And uh, we had a flow where the pressure did not vary in the Z direction. With all of these assumptions, we've arrived at our final um, differential equation to solve. And it's not too difficult to solve, but it's worth going all the way through to the end and discussing a little bit the boundary conditions. So this was the Z component of the Navier-Stokes equation. And the Navier-Stokes equation is a partial differential equation. But if we go back through our solution, we found from the mass balance that dVz dz equals zero. We, at our most immediate previous step, assumed that due to wide flow, there was no variation in the y direction. These two facts tell us that the velocity is not a function of z, the velocity is not a function of y, which means it's only a function of x. So because it's now only a function of x, I can change those partial derivatives to total derivatives. All right, so now I'm going to solve this equation. I'll move my density, uh, the gravity term to the other side and I'll have d squared vz dx squared equals minus rho g cos beta divided by mu. This quantity is all a bunch of constants, so I can just call that a. And I have the second derivative of uh, the function v is equal to a constant a. So the second derivative is just the derivative of the first derivative. And so when I integrate once, I get the first derivative. The integral of a constant is the constant times the variable I'm integrating over. And then I must add an integration constant. This integration constant, which was em emphasized in your calculus classes, may not have seemed that important, but it's critically important in applying these equations to real physical systems. Now we'll integrate again, and when we integrate dv dx, we just get the function v. And now we integrate the right-hand side. The integral of ax is ax squared over 2. The integral of a constant is the constant times the variable, and we always add the integration constant. So you see, if we had forgotten the integration constant at this step, this term with the x wouldn't have been here at all. So there's the velocity profile. We now need to evaluate those two constants with boundary conditions. And the boundary conditions, to figure those out, we have to go back to the problem and find at two locations in the flow, what are the values of the velocity. And this too takes a little bit of practice. In this problem, there's a classic boundary condition here at the wall. The boundary condition at the wall is that the flow comes to a rest at the wall, that there is no velocity at the wall. That's called the no-slip boundary condition, and it refl reflects the fact that we're saying that there's no slippage of the fluid at the wall. To use this boundary condition, we need to write in our coordinate system the location of the wall, and then what is the value of the function vz at the wall. So the location of the wall is x equal h, and what's happening is that the velocity is going to zero. So our first velocity boundary condition is going to be at the wall, vz is zero. So vz is zero when x is equal to h. This is the no-slip condition. So at x equal h, we can put h's in here for x. 
we put vz equals zero, we get one equation in the two unknowns, c1 and c2. So we get zero equals a h squared over two plus c1 h plus c2. So this is one equation, two unknowns. So we, these are the two unknowns, c2 and c1. h is known, a we know from a previous slide is minus rho g cos beta over mu. Now the second boundary condition, again this takes a little bit of practice, but the second boundary condition is at the second boundary, which is at the top surface of the fluid. And at the top surface of the fluid, velo the velocity comes to a maximum. We know it comes to a maximum because at this top surface, it has contact with air, and at that surface, the air has a very low velocity, a very low, excuse me, um, viscosity, and it generates very, very little stress on the, let's say, water that's flowing down this plate. So the very low stress of the air through Newton's law of viscosity tells us that the uh, velocity must come to a maximum at that point. So to write that second boundary condition, okay, we'll kind of sketch our problem here again. This is the x direction, this is the z. What we're saying here is that this is air and this is, let's say, water. We're saying that according to Newton's law of viscosity, the stress is equal to minus mu dvz dx. This is tau xz. And in the air phase, this viscosity is really so small that the stress is zero. So the stress is zero tells us that in the water phase, where we can write the same thing, tau xz of the water is equal to minus mu, this is the air viscosity, minus mu water, dvz dx. These two must be equal at that boundary, and since the air one is zero, this must be zero. So our boundary condition is dvz dx equals zero at the surface, which is at x equals zero. That's perhaps the trickiest part of the problem, but this boundary condition is very handy. If we go back to our solution, dvz dx we had back here. At x equals zero, dvz dx is zero, tells us that c1 is zero. Okay, so this is boundary condition one. Boundary condition two is dvz dx equals zero at x equals zero. When we plug that in, we get c1 equals zero. Knowing c1 is zero, we can plug that into this equation and solve for c2. Knowing c2, we can put c2 in here, pick up the a from the previous slide, and we'll get our final result for the velocity.